Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to learn about all the ins and outs of the new display boards and display links added in the Create.5 update. So essentially what the display board is, it's a giant configurable sign. Now when you place it down in your world, you'll notice two things. One is it's kind of in the center of the block, meaning you can't like place it on a wall, there'll be a bit of a gap. And the second thing is it'll have that kind of cog on the side. Now you get this really cool little placement arrow that'll kind of let you place it to the side really easily without actually having to like place it on the side of the block. And then to power this up, all you got to do is place a cog on the side and then give it at least 32 speed. So you can see by default this is set to 16, so it'll say it appears that the display board is not rotating with enough speed. So I can just go ahead and up this to 32, and as soon as it's at 32 speed, your display board will function. So even though the display board takes 32 speed to work, it actually takes up no stress in your system, meaning we can run as big of a display board as we want off of a single water wheel. So in a practical sense, I've got a full water wheel set up here, and all you need to do is place a large cog and then a small cog to essentially double the speed, because by default it's at 16 RPM. That takes it to 32 RPM, giving us a functional display board. So the simplest way to write to display board is just by right clicking on it with the name tag and you'll write down whatever that name tag says on that line. Each block has two lines on it, meaning you can do two lines of text per block. Now what you can't do is place it further down, so you can only have like one set of words per line. But what you could do is display boards don't actually have to be in a square. So what I could do is I could actually like take out more display boards to the side here place down my first bit of text and my second bit of text over here. Now if a line is modified, so either made longer or shorter, it will actually delete all the text on that line. So if I have text on this line and I delete this block, it'll go away. Or if I have text on this line and make it longer, it'll go away. Once you have text placed down, you can actually color it. So by right clicking the text with some dye, you can actually color it whatever color you want. Now to get rid of the color, you will have to go back in with white dye or delete the line, and then once the line is deleted and placed back down, the color will be gone. And if you want to clear out a line without deleting the block, all you got to do is right click on that line and it will delete the block. Now hopping into survival, what's really cool about this is you can see when I use the name tags and dies, it doesn't actually use them up. Meaning you only need one of each die and one of whatever name tag you want to write down to set up your display boards. And then the last thing we're going to take a look at with the display boards is you can actually write special characters. So any special character that can be put onto a name tag can be written down on display boards, meaning you can do some really cool stuff with this um, and really decorate it to your heart's content. Along with the display boards, the display links can also write to Nixie tubes. So we give it a second to ping here, and then as soon as it pings, it'll update. You can also write to signs. And when it writes to signs, you can actually choose which line. So you see it pings, it'll say potato. You change this to line three, and it'll update line three. And it can even write to lecterns. So if I go ahead and place this here, whenever it pings, it'll update the book we have in our lectern. And we can even update the page we want this information on. So if I go to page three, it'll update page three. I can actually take that book, and I'll have that information. So now we're going to take a look at all the different ways you can read information and write them to display boards. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is the depot because that's the simplest. The way the depot is going to work is if an item is on a depot, it'll read that item name. Now if I were to go ahead and change this to line 3, see it'll move to line 3, or I can leave it at line 2, and it'll be on line 2. Now what's really cool about this is it's actually going to read the name of it. So if I were to go ahead and put in a potato that's named, whenever it updates, you'll see it'll update that name. It'll actually display the name it has. Another cool thing about writing to display boards is you can attach a label. So I could go ahead and attach a label. So I could say item, then it will say item potato. And we can update that and see what's in our depot. Now the way the depots work is it's only gonna be what's actively in there whenever it pings. So you can see these two depots with the emerald are pinging, but the emerald is never in quite the right depot when it's pinging. So even though there's items there quite often, it's not actually updating. And you can see every once in a while, it will actually catch the emerald. So you can see right there, caught the emerald, and it updated the text to say emerald. Now even though there's not an emerald in there, whenever it's pinging, there is an emerald in there, so it's going to keep it updated to emerald, even though it's empty most of the time. So definitely an interesting way you can use it, but maybe not the most efficient. The next thing we're going to take a look at is reading information from a belt. So if we have a display link on a belt, what it'll do is it'll read whatever item is there to our display board. 
So if I go ahead and break this block, you'll see it'll read redstone dust because it's reading whatever item is right here. Now what you might notice is every once in a while it'll read when it's kind of like right in the middle of this redstone dust and it'll read that there's nothing there. There's no really good way around that. So this system might really work best if it's something that's kind of stopped up because otherwise it's going to have a hard time actually reading information where half the time it's going to be an empty block. So the next thing we're going to take a look at is the first thing we actually have some different options and that is reading off of a tunnel. So you can read off of an andesite or a brass tunnel, it's going to do the same thing. We have a whole bunch of different items. So we have item throughput, which you can read in per second, per minute, or per hour. Or we can read accumulate item count which reads the total items that we have gone through that funnel. So I've got three different ones here with the label per minute, per hour, and per second. And then I have this other one back here reading the accumulated item count. So if we're gonna take a look at this board, see the accumulated item count is a really high number and it just keeps on going up. And we have our items per second, per minute, and per hour. So 23 items a second, about 1,300 items per minute, or 82,900 items per hour. So this is a really cool way to make sure that your factory is kind of keeping up. Or if you have a kind of variable output, you can see like if you're doing really good or really bad at that current moment. Now what we notice here is our accumulated item count. I've got an item and a stack. So you can see what item goes through, it goes up by one. When the stack goes through, it goes up by 64. And then if I were to come over here to our rotational speed controller and we just said sped this up all the way to max speed, you can see our items per second is going to go up like crazy. See, so it kind of takes a little bit to kind of catch up to what it's actually reading out. And you can see it's 107 items per second or 386,000 items per hour at max speed. And these are really cool because instead of pinging every once in a while, it'll ping every time an item goes through a tunnel. So next we're going to take a look at these seats. So the way the seats work is if there's a mob mm -hmm. sitting down in a seat, it'll read what mob is in that seat. So you can see once it pings, it'll read Mushroom. And this works with all kinds of different moms. So you can see we can get a Creeper, you can get a Guardian, it'll read that there's a Guardian there. You can even get a Cat. What's really cool about putting different animals in here is you can actually name them, and it'll show the name of the animal you have in there. So not only does it show there's a cat, but it'll actually show the name of that cat. And along with showing the names of all the different mobs, it will also show the names of any player seated. So if I were to go ahead and sit in this seat, you'll see it'll update and it'll say Pole Art is sitting in this seat, which is a really cool little use of the display links. The next thing we're going to take a look at is the content observers. So what the content observers do is you can either list matching items or do the amount of matching items, or you can do the list of fluids or the amount of fluids. So the way this works is if I were to go ahead and have some items in this chest, I can put 64 polished andesite. I've got one reading the amount of items and one reading the list of items. You can see we have item count 64 and we have 64 polished andesite. If I go ahead and put more stuff in here, see that'll update so that way we have 64 calcite, 64 stones, 64 gravel, 64 polished andesite for a total of 256 blocks. If I take like a half stack of this and then put like 16 of those in there, you'll see it'll automatically update to the correct counts. And when it lists the matching items, we can do the value display shortened or full number. What that means is by default, it's always gonna be shortened. So if I were to like fill this entire chest up with stone, bottom to top, you'll see it'll say 3K stone. So it's like 3000 stone. But if I updated this, I could do full number. Then it'll show 3,264 stone. This isn't too helpful for a chest because this can only be displayed on a single block. However, if we had a giant vault and we had like a lot, a lot, a lot of stone, it might be nice to show that in the K values or the thousands. And then we can do the same thing with tanks. So if I go ahead and take this potion, fill up this tank a little bit, you'll see it'll update. We have our fluid volume at 4,250 millibuckets and we have 4.3 buckets of potion of slow falling. And then if I made it a little higher, we have 5,500 millibuckets and 5.5 buckets of potion of slow falling. Next, we're gonna take a look at the stockpile switch. So the stockpile switch gives you two different options, container fill level in percent and container fill level in progress bar. So what that means is as we go ahead and fill up this chest, you can see that our percent's gonna update to 14 and our little bar is gonna to start to fill up. Now the way the display bar works is it'll basically base off the size of our display board. So if we go ahead and shorten this all by one block, whenever it updates, 
You'll see before we were at three little blocks, now we're only at two little blocks. So it's gonna modify itself to the size of the board. So you can have a really big board to get a really granule um, percent bar, or you can have a really small one and still get a good idea of where you're at. Now for to go ahead and fill this up all the way to the top. So it'll be 100% and our bar will be all the way full. Take out a few different blocks, go down to 80% and be down just a little bit more. So now we're gonna take a look at reading from Nixie tubes. So not only can we write to Nixie tubes, we can also read from them. So if I were to go ahead and put information here, you'll see it will update here and it'll say, hello. Now what's really interesting about this is we can read and write to these, meaning we could kind of use these as like a midpoint. So let's say we had a super long factory. Over here we had something we wanted to read from. We could like place our Nixie tubes here and then the display link here connected to those Nixie tubes. Then we had our display board over here, or even more Nixie tubes, and we kind of link these up. So whenever this block updates, this will update, this will update, and we can kind of continue that down. So if you needed to extend your signal, reading and writing to Nixie tubes could be a really nifty way to make that happen. The other really interesting way you can use Nixie tubes is if you hook them up to a power source that's gonna change, it will show that updated power source. So you can see if I make this power three, it'll display that power. If I up this to power eight, it'll display that. So the Nixie tubes really are a clever tool and it's really interesting that you can read and write to them. And I'm excited to see the interesting things people end up doing with that. So now we're gonna take a look at the functional cuckoo clock. So if you have a powered cuckoo clock, you can hook up the display link to it and read time of day in 12 hour or 24 hour or have a stopwatch. So right now I have a time of day in 12 hours you can see right now it's 11.55 a.m. Now I do have daylight stopped, so if I go ahead and turn that back on, so I set daylight cycle to true, you'll see after just a little bit, it's now noon. Then after a little bit, it'll update to the next bit of time at 12.05, and that's basically just going off the Minecraft in-game time. Now the other thing we can do is do a stopwatch. The way that works is if you have a power source and you give it power, it'll reset your stopwatch and start counting up. So you can see before it was just over an hour, now it's back to four seconds, five seconds, six seconds, and so on. Now we're gonna take a look at the stressometer and speedometer. So the speedometer only has one option and that's to read the speed and RPM and it can ignore or include direction. And so we'll get our speed output here at 16 RPM, which is what a max water wheel is. And then include direction will either be negative or positive depending. Right now we're moving in what it's saying is the positive direction. If it was spinning the other way, it would say negative 16. Now the stressometer has a whole bunch of different options. We could read a progress bar, a percentage, a stress in SU, total capacity, and remaining SU. So if you're to take a look at this board here, you'll see our stress is currently at zero and zero percent because we're not actually using any stress. Zero SU, our total capacity is 256 and remaining is 256 because we're using zero of it. If I were to go ahead and hook up something that uses stress to this, so your stress is at 64, which is 25% of our total, meaning our capacity is at 256, and remaining is 192. If I were to hook up something that takes a little more stress to work, you'll see that'll up to 50, 50%, 128 stress, 256 SU, the remaining is 128 SU. This is really cool for a power factory, so you can actually get a really nice readout of where your power factory's at and to make sure you have enough power for whatever projects you're working on. And speaking of power, we can also read information from a boiler. So we have this new boiler set up, and you can read the boiler status, which we're reading to line two, and we get all this different information. We get our boiler status, which tells us the level of our boiler, the size, the water, and the heat. So all the information you usually see with goggles, we can actually display on a display board. And what's really neat about this is if I were to go ahead and slow down our water source, so let's say we're only pumping 32 water, which is not gonna be enough. After a minute, this will update, and it's actually gonna turn off. And you'll see our boiler status goes to idle, and our water is actually at zero. It's not getting enough water to even function at all. If that was improved just a little bit, you'll see that our water is at two bars, meaning that our boiler status is level two. And it's a really cool way to make sure that your whole factory is being fed and has everything that it needs to function at the right speeds. The next thing we're gonna take a look at is the target block. So the target block gives you a number and a progress bar based on your accuracy. So that's how close to the center of the block you get. So if we're way out on the side, we'll get a low accuracy. So you can see out on the side here, it's like one. Then if we get closer to the center, it's 13, 10, 11, 
just depending on how close you get to the center of the block. So we're going to come in here, try to hit directly in the center. 15, there you go. So you can see 15 is going to be the max it can go up to. The next thing we're going to take a look at is the respawn anchor. So what's really cool about the respawn anchor is anywhere in the world a display link is placed by a respawn anchor without anybody linked to it, it will actually count the amount of deaths in the world. So you can see right now I've died four times. If I were to go ahead and die again, my deaths will be raised to five. The next block we're going to take a look at is the enchanting table. So by hooking up a display link to an enchanting table, you'll get the max enchant cost, which is pretty cool because if you had a system where you wanted to kind of like vary it, sort of go ahead and like lower this down. So your cost will go from 18 all the way up to 30. If I were to raise it back up just like one block, you'll see we have an enchant of 22. It's a really cool way to get a readout of what your enchant level is at. And then the last thing you can do is you can hook a display link up to a command block and you can actually read scoreboard information. So if you had a scoreboard information, like you had red team and blue team, you could actually read um, their like scores or something onto the display board. I didn't take the time to get this to work, but it is a cool little function and something that you can do. And finally, we're going to take a look at hooking up the display links to train observers and train stations. So the first one we're going to take a look at is the train observer. So the way the train observer works is it'll read whatever train is on that observer. So this train just reached the station. We have our passenger train at the station. Now the second thing we can take a look at is the train schedule status. What that does is it reads on this station whatever is going on. So we have our train departing in five seconds. In five seconds, that train will depart. That'll go away. And as soon as it's off the train observer, the train name will also go away. So I've got this little system set up with a few different stations. So come here and take a look at our map. We have our passenger north, which is where we are, and a passenger south. And we have a train that's going from north to south and then back. Then we also have a storage train that's going from storage to item storage and then back, and a fluid train which is going from storage to fluid station and back. Now if I go ahead and take a look at our display link, what we can do is we can read train station summary. And what this means is any train at a specific station, it's going to give the summary of when they are headed to the next station. So if I go ahead and read passenger north, which is where we are, whenever the train comes into station, it'll say 45 seconds, passenger train is heading off to passenger south. And then once the train is actually in the station, it'll say now passenger train is headed to passenger south. And when it actually departs, it's going to reset to when the train is going to be back. So now the passenger train is left, what we'll see is it'll say three minutes, the passenger train will be back and it will head to passenger south. So it's a little confusing because it's not actually reading when the train will be here, but it's reading when the train will be here headed to its next destination. So the way this looks with multiple trains is I have another display link reading our storage station. And this will basically tell us what's going on with the storage station. So in one minute, the item train and the tanker train will reach the station and head to the fluid station. So you can see now it's 45 seconds, and then we can see once our item train reaches the station and starts unloading, we'll see the item train is now departing for the item station as soon as it's done. What we can see is the tanker train is now waiting in line. Now this won't actually update if it's waiting in line. It'll basically still say now, even though it's waiting in line, it'll leave to the fluid station as soon as it's done docking at our storage area. So I hope that explains everything well enough and gives you some good ideas of how to use the display boards. If you got any questions on the display boards, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll get to as many of them as I can. Thank you guys for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. In the meantime, go create something awesome. Bye-bye.